Marines. Over the past few months, Sergeant Major Barrett and I have met with thousands of non-commissioned officers. We will visit with many more of you in the months to come, but we won't be able to reach everyone in person as soon as we'd like. Until then, we want to share with you a condensed version of the discussion we've been having. We call this initiative Reawakening the Soul of the Corps, and its overriding purpose is to concentrate our minds on who we are and what we do. As we wrap up 12 years of combat and reset our core for the conflicts to come, we are refocusing our attention on those attributes that best define us. Discipline, faithful obedience to orders, concerned and engaged leadership, and strict adherence to high standards. It's been our experience that once we've had a chance to explain what this is all about, Marines get it. Please take a few minutes to listen closely, for you are the key to success. I'm going to take you back in history just a little bit. And uh, let's go to the first slide. And go back, to, uh, go back to what life was like after World War II. Now, remember what happened during that. We, we went out to the Pacific. We fought all the way from the Marshall Islands all the way up north. And we fought for about three to four straight years. And we made the famous landing on Iwo Jima, and, and that really began to turn things favorably for the United States of America. It gave America hope that actually we could win this war. And after Iwo Jima, we had a lot of hard fighting left to do one of which was Okinawa, and Marines fought ferociously on Okinawa. We worked our way up, and then finally, in 1946, the armistice was signed, and America was done with war in the Pacific. And we felt pretty good about ourselves. We, we had every single reason to be confident that America surely loved its Marine Corps, and we would be around for a long time. It didn't happen. I mean, almost when the peace bells began to ring, almost instantly, the manpower in the Marine Corps began to drop like an elevator. And so after World War II, Marine Corps went from 450,000 down to just a little under 75,000 Marines. And it happened just like that. And you ask yourself the question, what were we thinking about? What was our nation thinking about when they did that. By the way, they did the same thing to the Army and the Navy, and they didn't have an Air Force in those days. They were still part of the Army Air Corps. But we did that, and we, we fell in love as a nation with this matter of technical solutions to the hard business of war fighting. In this case, it was a nuclear bomb. We dropped two of them, you know that. And the nuclear age was dawned, and everybody began to think, well, that's the solution. We'll never have to put thousands and thousands of Marines ashore in a place like Iwo Jima or Okinawa or Guadalcanal. That'll never happen again because technology is going to take us into the next half of the century. We really miss, we really miss that because the next war would be a push-button exchange of nuclear weapons. And let's go to the next slide. And this is what happened in the early part of 1950. The North Koreans attacked, now this is less than four years after the end of World War II. The North Koreans, we woke up one morning, North Korea had attacked across the DMZ and across and, and had taken Seoul. Now there's probably 14 to 15 million people living in Seoul, or maybe more than that. We were just there not long ago. So in those days, it wasn't quite as condensed and, and, and packed, but still a lot of people. The North Koreans attacked and just ran right across the border. The Army Division, the Army Corps that was actually the Army Army that was on the ground and on the peninsula, began to reel back. At that point, there were really no Marines on the Korean Peninsula. And, and what you see here is you see the arrows going north as if we're attacking north. This is just an old map. What really happened to begin with is all those arrows were pointing downward. And, and there was none of this attacking north. Everybody was retrograding all the way back. And the United States almost got pushed completely off the Korean Peninsula. I mean, almost they came all the way down to uh, these areas down in here, 
trying to figure out before we could finally stop the North Koreans. Our equipment, our training was abysmal. The Army was ill-prepared for this. The United States of America was ill-prepared for this. Poor discipline among the troops and the forces there. There was no sense of who's in charge and a good sergeant uh, knows what he's doing. There was none of that. Most of those great sergeants had, had left the Marine Corps and had left the, uh, left the Army at that point in time. We were living what, what people are talking about today. There's this thing called the peace dividend. People around Washington today are talking about, well, when we finish uh, the mission in December of 2014, there'll be a peace dividend. And America can kind of come back home and reset. That's precisely what everybody thought at the end of World War II. There'll be a peace dividend. Well, Marines, we were living the peace dividend in 1950. And, and the results were absolutely abysmal. Next slide. This great author, author, Fehrenbach, wrote this quote. I'll give you a chance to take a look at it. We've relearned this lesson many, many times. We almost had to relearn it the hard way in, in 2000. Because from 1998 to 2000, America became enamored with a thing called the Revolution of Military Affairs. And that's where we took a lot of our money, instead of putting it in ground forces, we put it in technology. We put it in high-speed weapons, thinking that surely we'll never need ground forces again. We'll never need forces that will have to go occupy a piece of terrain. And as in Fairbox said, he said, by putting legions, your young men, into the mud. That's the lesson that came out of World War II. Next slide. And for us, quite honestly, it was the Marine Corps. It was the emaciated Marine Corps post-World War II. We didn't forget that. We hadn't forgotten the lessons that came out of World War II. Yeah, we were a small force, 74,000. Not a lot of us left. But we had enough veterans left in, in, in the Marine Corps in 1950 that they understood the value of discipline. But it was those Marines, those sergeants and corporals that knew what they were doing. They became the legions of Marines that quite honestly saved the day in Korea. Next slide. In my 43 years of being a Marine, I've watched this happen now three times. We can't relax. There's no such thing for Marines as a peace dividend. That's not who we are. That's not what we do for the United States of America. We don't come back and say we're going to reset and everything's going to be good and we take our packs off. That doesn't happen to us. It may happen to other services, but not, not America's Corps of Marines. And I'll tell you what, our future value and and a trust factor with the American people in Congress resides on our ability to respond to today's crisis today. Good morning, everybody. Like the Marines that fought before us, before you, whether they shot their muskets from the top of the riggings in the man of war in the 18th century, whether they fought across the wheat fields, in World War I, or the islands of World War II, or the frozen mountains of Korea, or through the jungles of Vietnam, or the rubble of Beirut, or the mean streets of Somalia, Bosnia, Iraq, Afghanistan, where we find ourselves today, something drew those people to service. And in some cases, they were drawn to service because of conscription, because of draft. I want you to go back to that moment when in your life something drew you into that federal building where you stood before a commissioned officer of the armed forces, the American flag was at your back and you raised your right hand, go back to the moment where you were drawn to serve. Unlike years past, battles past, 
when you look at today, 310 million Americans and 0.4% of the nation wears the uniform of any branch of service. And if you wear this cloth, it's less than one-tenth of a single percent will ever wear the uniform of a United States Marine. And in no other time in our nation's history, we have been fighting this long. Twelve years engaged in continuous combat. And we're doing it at a time when it's an all-volunteer force. You all could have gone and done anything you wanted in your life, but you didn't choose an easy life. You chose to be tougher people. And, you've been, and you were drawn to service. And here you are. So please, find in your head, where were you? What was it that brought you to the cloth of this nation? Because I have to tell you, it's a privilege to be able to serve in this capacity. And the Commandant and I, and I'll tell you right now, we talk about it often, we're humbled because you could have done anything you wanted in your life, but you chose this life. 98% of the Marine Corps is doing it right. Take a second to digest that. And I want you to know, behind every one of those pop-ups are headlines in newspapers and magazines that reflect an unclean honor. Next slide, please. The second word says it all, all by itself. It's shameful. What do you all want to be associated with? What do you all want to be known for? Do you want to be known for that force that's America's expeditionary force in readiness that's forward deployed and forward engaged and we're shaping training and deterring aggression and responding to every crisis, conflict, and contingency around the world? I want each of you to go back to that day at boot camp at Paris Island or at San Diego, at the end of the 11th week, when you just finished the crucible. And I'd ask that you put aside how your experiences in the Marine Corps, set aside how hard you are or how tough you are or what MOS you have. And I'd ask you to go back to how you felt when you finished the crucible. When that drill instructor came by and looked you in the eye and you stuck your palm of your hand out, just like I have up there on the cover of this, stuck that palm out, and he or she put that Eagle Globeman anchor in your hand for the very first time, I know precisely how you felt. You believed every single thing that that drill instructor told you. I don't care how hard or how, how miserable he or she made your life, there was no doubt in your mind that that sergeant or that staff sergeant had your best interest at, at heart. You knew what sergeants did, you understood it, and you had a picture of what a sergeant looked like and how a sergeant acted and how a sergeant cared for his or her Marines. Every single one of you had it. So when you graduated from boot camp and graduated from SOI, in your mind you had a good sense for what NCOs were all about. And you were a private. And maybe you were a meritorious PFC because you were the honor graduate. But you knew about sergeants. And I would argue that what I have up there in that box the blue box where I talk about what happens on the parade decks at Paris Island and at San Diego or in the hills of Quantico. That's what makes us the Marines. It's the hardening of body and mind, the infusion of discipline, and we're going to come back to discipline. The infusion of discipline and the casting of an indelible esprit de corps forged in the cauldron of things endured and things accomplished, such as regiments hand down forever. And just like Bruce Krulak had on that last quote that Sergeant Major Barrett had up there, I conclude that paragraph down there and I, and I wrote, it's almost spiritual. I'm not talking religion here. 
I'm not embarrassed about my faith, so that's not it. But I'm not talking religion. I'm talking about it's almost spiritual, that feeling that we had when you became a Marine for the first time. That's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about that that resides inside of us that causes us to know that we're different than anybody else. We're different than the other services are. We're United States Marines. We are called to a higher calling. All that stuff that Sergeant Major Barrett talked about on that previous slide where it showed all that bad stuff, and he said, this is not who we are. Intuitively, we know that's not who we are. We don't have to have anybody tell us that. We don't have to have the Sergeant Major of the Marine Corps stand up and point up and go, that's not who we are. Marines, this is who we are. We're those young men and women that are called to a purpose. We need leaders. We need you to reflect back because you are a sergeant or a corporal and think back on those drill instructors and those instructors you had at School of Infantry and boot camp. At the very bottom in the call out box, at the very, very bottom, right at the very tail end of this paragraph right in here, I put, we are all, regardless of rank or MOS, fiercely proud of the title Marine. Being a Marine is what we value the most. This is who we are. I'm more fiercely proud about being a United States Marine than I am about anything else. Next slide. We had the opportunity as we began to pull together what now is this reawakening brief. But several months ago, Sergeant Major and I were, we, we spent hours talking about what do we, what do we, how do we do this? How do we talk to corporals and sergeants and help them understand where they fit and help them understand the immense responsibility they have as we move forward from a Marine Corps that's been in a 10, 11 straight years of continuous combat and how important their leadership is. and how crucial this time is right now as we reorient. And so I said, you know, Sergeant Major, I don't, I don't know what our sergeants would tell us if we asked them who they are. And he said, well, I've got a good idea. We've got sergeants courses that are about to begin. Let's ask the sergeants. And so I, I sent a message out through the Sergeant Major. I wanted two questions answered, simple. I wanted every sergeant that was attending that resident course to tell me who we are. What do we do as Marines for our nation? So I got a binder back, and I got to tell you what, it's amazing. I've still got it in my house. And it is a response from every single sergeant. And so I remember we were going to give this, we we're going to do the first presentation down at Camp Lejeune on Monday. It was Sunday morning in my office at home, and I'm reading through all this, and I went, wow, this is amazing. So I copied down some of what was told, what was sent to me by the sergeants. I didn't change a word of it. So let's take a look at what the sergeants, your fellow sergeants, your fellow NCOs told me of who they are. We are the history of generations yet to come. The sergeant went on to say we are a community of sacrifice. We are a living oath to the morals, values, and principles that we believe in, stand for, and what we were founded upon. We're professional warriors, boy, we are. Nobody is more professional at, at fighting wars and being a warrior than we are. Nobody. There's not another service in the face of the earth that's more professional. We know how to do that business, and we've been doing it for 11, 11 years. The last part on here, the sergeant said, we are brothers and sisters bonded by selflessness and duty. I didn't make this up. I didn't ask him to say something really poignant or come up with something really scholarly. I just asked the sergeants, you tell me who you are. Then I asked him, what do we do for a nation? Next slide. So you just heard the Commandant talk about exactly who we are in a few slides back. 
15, 20 minutes ago. You saw me lay out all the things you know that we are not because we're so much better than that. And in the two questions that the Commandant asked all the sergeants that were starting the sergeant's course, who are we and what do we do? What do you do for our nation? And I want to call out and highlight that very bottom bullet because every time I read it, I do get chills. We sacrifice body, mind, life, and family to serve. We give ourselves completely with no questions. We miss birthdays, funerals, births, first days of school, first bike rides to serve our country. And at the end of the day, our only known identity is not a sergeant or a corporal. We are United States Marines. That's what we do. So you know who we are. You know what we do for our nation, and you absolutely do know what we're not. Next, please. I'm going to read you a passage right out of the Enlisted Promotion Manual. And it deals with the institutional imperative, the must-have. Marines in the ranks and the grades of corporal and sergeant are required to exercise an ever-increasing degree of maturity, leadership, and professionalism. To a large extent, accomplishment of the ultimate mission, success in battle. Success in battle depends on the manner in which Marines are developed into small unit leaders and their professional abilities. Every Marine recommended must be worthy of the title non-commissioned officer. And let me tell you what's more profound about that very last statement, that very last sentence. Today, the United States Marine Corps is right at or about 194,000. Where's the uniform? 173,000 make up the enlisted force. 89% of everybody that wears the uniform in the active component is enlisted. And here's the number you sh that should really wake you up. 144,000 are sergeants and below. Sergeants, you are responsible to and being held accountable for 83% of the entire Marine Corps. Think about that. Corporals, you're being held accountable to and responsible for 66% of the entire enlisted force. If that doesn't wake you up, the institutional imperative must be worthy of the title non-commissioned officer and you're responsible for 83% of the enlisted force, that's the wow factor. And I know for a fact, every single person in this room has been promoted three or four times. And I also know that you have all stood in formations where you've heard the enlisted promotion warrant, the NCO's promotion warrant, and read hundreds if not thousands of times. Is that a fair statement to make? Hundreds and thousands of times? Well, let me just define the enlisted promotion warrant for you. In the very few first few lines, you hear the words special trust. Special trust defined as the unquestioning belief in your integrity, strength, and abilities. And you hear the word confidence and defined as the self-reliance, assurance, and boldness. And you hear the word fidelity, which is strict observance of or faithfulness to promise. And you hear the word abilities, which is the power or capacity to act. And you hear the word diligent, which is constant in effort to accomplish, never quitting. And my favorite four lines, believe it or not, all put together, it's right at the end of Line 9 and the start of line 10, it's where the Commandant of the Marine Corps says, I do strictly direct. And collectively those four words are defined as to carry out the organizing, energizing, 
and supervision, to dominate and to determine the course, to train and lead, having responsibility for. Your appointment letter, that promotion warrant, a document that hasn't changed in 200 years and quite and, and, and ten, about 10 years ago, actually the commandant added to the NCO's promotion warrant, giving you more authority and responsibility. The definition of the promotion warrant gives you the authority to give and to receive more responsibilities. Because service as a non-commissioned officer is a privilege. And it is a privilege founded on integrity that brings with it great responsibility. NCOs, you are the opportunity. You are the solution. As a matter of fact, you are the main effort to help us to eviscerate all those problems, those societal ills. I need every one of you in the fight. Never forget who we are and what you do for our country. Turn the tide on this fight. Stop that 2% from making poor life choices. Next slide, please. When we sat down and wrote that letter, we had in mind the state of the Corps right now. And we, we talked about this matter of reawakening the soul of the Corps. But, well, what do you mean by this reawakening? If you go back to that last slide, we talk about reawakening the soul of the Corps, which is the fundamental business of the Marine Corps. That's the discipline. That's the adherence to standards. That's that 24-hour-a-day, seven-day-a-week, 365-day-a-year engaged leadership. And when we start talking about leadership, people go, well, that's intrusive leadership. You're getting in my business, and, and it's my private time while I'm home. Well, we don't do that in combat. We actually care for one another. We actually have sergeants and corporals that pay attention to lance corporals and PFCs and privates because that's their job. But back home in America, we've turned our back on it. You know exactly what I'm talking about. We can't afford to be that way. We're too good. As we reset this Marine Corps, we go back to this, kind of reawaken the fundamental things that caused us to be so great in battle. Discipline, adherence to standards, 24-7 engaged leadership. We need that. You know, We've learned so many good habits in the 11 years of combat. But when we've come back home, we've kind of turned our back on those things and we just say, we don't have time for those things because we're back home. America's gonna call on its Marines again and it will happen overnight. And it's gonna be us, it's gonna be you. It'll be the soul of the core, the backbone that will make the difference on the next Korea or the next Iraq or the next Afghanistan. It's just getting back to the fundamental basics of being a United States Marine. It's exactly what it was like when you graduated from boot camp. You knew it, it was boom, boom, boom. You knew precisely how to act and what to be. That's, that's, that's what we're talking about. We must do a better job of enforcing those policies and those things that already exist. Next slide. Everything that your leadership expects and demands, everything that the Commandant and I expect and demand of every one of you is the same exact thing that you all expect and demand of those wonderful Marines that you are privileged to lead and serve. Same exact expectations and demands. Ours are the same as yours. There is no greater accomplishment that can be bestowed upon another than to be told, I can count on you always. That's what we expect and that's what we demand. And you know what? You execute, you execute that document that hasn't changed in over 200 years, your promotion warrant. We need you. Don't walk out of here and let anybody steal the 
feel the march on the message. Don't let anybody come to you and say, well, this is just another matter of, of the Commandant the Sergeant Major wanting me to move from my apartment in Alexandria into the barracks. You know, I, we were out at Camp Pendleton, and, and the truth of the matter is, when we asked the sergeants to move back in the barracks at Pendleton, we just got the report last week, something like 95% of them volunteered to come back in the barracks and be the leadership in that barracks. This isn't a matter of trying to harass anybody, but I've got Lance Corporals and PFCs that are in our barracks. We don't have a lot of them around the Washington area because we're a little bit more senior. Well, you get out in the fleet and they're there. And there's no leadership, nobody's paying attention to them. Bad things happen, you go, well, how did that happen? Well, we know, there's no leadership. So there's nobody harassing any of my sergeants. I wouldn't allow anybody to harass one of my sergeants. But we need you to step up. We need you to have an appreciation for the lessons of history, where we are in those, in those kind of that pattern, that recognize the pattern of what happens. And also understand that we've got a busy future ahead of us. I mean, America needs its Marine Corps. The world is not going to be a nice place. It's not now and it will not be in the future. And you're the solution. Sergeant Major used 2%. I think he's right. 98% of the Corps is heading right down the path. But 2% is not. 2% is bringing that shame on our Corps. And you can stop that. You can. And you've got a leadership and a moral obligation to do precisely that. Marines, we never get tired of telling you how proud we are of you. Your honor, your courage, and your commitment are on display every day of the week. The reawakening is aimed at celebrating and reinforcing the best in you and in the Marines you lead. Embrace the privilege and responsibility you have earned. Continue to do great deeds and endure. Keep clean the honor of our Corps and remain faithful and ready. Thank you, Marines, for who you are and all you do. Semper Fidelis.